David G. and I want to speak today on the topic of Lahiri Mahashaya, who really is not only the example that most of us aspire toward, but in many ways he is like the founder of this particular ray of the divine that has come to us in the form of Swamiji and Ananda and the teachings that we follow. If you remember from the autobiography of a yogi, the story of Lahiri's meeting with Babaji in the Himalayas, he had gone to Raniket, called there by his office, because he was an accountant for the British railroads. And so his instructions came, his orders came, to go to Ronicat, where they were beginning to build, the British were beginning to build a kind of a military compound, which in fact still exists today. And so he was at the very beginning of that, called to Ronicat, but there really wasn't much to do in terms of accounting. And so he began to wander the nearby hillsides looking for saintly people that he would inquire about and try to find and meet. And in one of these wanderings, he heard a voice calling him and he followed that voice and came eventually to meet Babaji, who had called him. And Lahiri began to get a little nervous about needing to return to the office. And Babaji, paraphrasing something that Jesus had said in the Bible, said, the office was made for you, not you for the office. And in other words, that you were called here for your own benefit, not in order to do work. And that benefit, of course, was this divine meeting between Lahiri Mahashaya and Babaji. We recently came from Italy and even more recently ended our time in Rome, where there is the huge church uh, in the Vatican, and in that church is the Sistine Chapel and some of the most famous paintings in the world. And one of those, one of the most famous images that art has ever created is the creation story where God is reaching out and his forefinger is touching the forefinger of Adam who is reaching up, meaning that's the divine creating mankind. Well, in that meeting between Babaji and Lahiri, it's as if that same process happened. The divine met, I can't say mankind because Lahiri was already an avatar, but in this case, he was playing the role on the behalf of all of us of a householder seeking God. And so here's the divine, giving the divine touch to the householder seeking him or the devotee seeking him. Because even though Lahiri played the outer role of a householder, he was not a typical householder. And he certainly did not identify his reality with the aspect of being in a particular worldly role, that is being a husband and a father and someone who had to hold a job. <clears throat> but there was a deep purpose to that. If you remember again from the autobiography of a yogi, after that first meeting, Lahiri, I won't recount the whole of it, but Babaji essentially touched him and Lahiri went into a state of samadhi for many days. 
and he remembered his past lives. He remembered his past lives in that cave with Babaji, the little bowl that he had, the little asan that he had, and he remembered all of that from the past so that in that divine touch, he reawakened to who he really was. Well, that too is highly symbolic for us because all of us are yearning to reawaken to who and what we truly are. That is the essence of creation. The essence of Sanatan Dharma is that God created us from his own consciousness. But overlaying that consciousness, he also created the delusion and the loss of memory, the loss of Shmriti, that makes us unaware of our own indwelling divinity and of our own connection with the divine. And yet, the way that the divine drama is works is that deep yearning, that melancholy to come back to our true <coughs> state of consciousness, of knowing who we are, of being one with God, is <coughs> ultimately the driving force, the motivating force that propels us from lifetime to lifetime to lifetime. And so many of us, perhaps all of us, have studied evolution as we went through our schooling. But the true evolution is the evolution of unknowing to knowing, of delusion to the lack of delusion, of mo or delusion to the cutting of delusion, the ksha, the moksha that we are all seeking and will eventually attain. Well, again, that symbolic meeting with Lahiri and Babaji was the cutting of the delusion. Now, with a great, great saint like Lahiri, who was Kabir in a past lifetime, as well as other lofty roles that he played. In fact, he did not need that moksha. Uh, he didn't have delusion that needed to be cut, but he was playing a role demonstrating for all of us this process. And so after that period of samadhi, he begged Babaji to allow him to remain in the Himalayas with that small band that basically were just in constant divine union and had no other responsibility, no other life, no other anything going on except to live in the remembrance of God in the in in the lofty state of samadhi and not have to bother about any of the other aspects of creation. But Babaji told him, no, that is not your role in this life. There is a reason that I did not call you here until you had worldly responsibilities of, um, you know, modest ones, but nonetheless a family with children. He had five children, and he had a job in order to support that family. And so he had those worldly responsibilities. And Babaji said, you have to go back to those responsibilities to demonstrate that God can be found regardless of outer circumstances. And that, for all of us, is a model that we don't have to leave the life that we're leading now, but we have to live that life in a way where we understand and come to the realization that God is there in the midst of that life also in whatever circumstances, because it is a delusion to think that circumstances are keeping us from finding God. 
that we're too busy to find God, that we have to earn a living, therefore we can't find God, that we have children and noise around us, therefore we can't find God. This beautiful setting here, it's lovely to have a setting like this. It could be in ancient Vedic India, outside talking about God sitting together, but we have the noise of traffic and the flyover and all of the distractions of the modern world that keeps it from being Vedic India. But does that mean that we can't find God in this day and age? If we fall into that delusion, we might as well just quit eating, go into a fast until we leave this body and wait for a better age. But that is not the divine expression. The divine expression as expressed through Lahiri is that no matter what, in this day and age, we can, in fact, no matter what our circumstances, find God. I'm going to move this. The sun is symbolic of the spiritual eye, but to the outer eyes and to the head, it's better to have the sun inside rather than outside. So I'll try to stay in the shade here. But so we think that this is a drama. Then, of course, the other part, an extremely significant part, is that Babaji initiated Lahiri into the science of Kriya Yoga and told him that this secret technique was given only to highly advanced souls and that he was to go and give this technique to other highly advanced souls. But Lahiri asked on our behalf, can I not offer this technique to sincere men and women who are longing for God but may not yet be highly advanced, but this will allow them to become highly advanced? And Babaji said, so be it, God has spoken through you. Now I want to talk about these two things, Lahiri coming only after being a householder and having responsibility, and also the science of Kriya. Because there is actually a backstory to that. Lahiri, of course, was already enlightened. He was already a Jivan Mukta. Beyond a Jivan Mukta, he was an avatar, meaning that he had no karma of his own to bring him back. But looking at the modern times that we are, that he was going to incarnate in, he said, this is a very busy and a very restless time that I'm going to incarnate in. And people in this age don't have the long, long hours and the more gentle flow of living extremely simply and living a village life, a Vedic life, where they can spend long, long hours chanting to God or meditating on God. And in this day and age, they need a more efficient technique. They need a more efficient path. And so let us reintroduce into this lifetime the science of Kriya Yoga, which had become at that time hidden through priestly secrecy, as Master puts it in uh, autobiography. And so Lahiri actually incarnated in order to be the vehicle through which this efficient path for this age was brought into the world. And so probably when he received his initiation into Kriya Yoga, one could speculate that you could count the number of Kriya Yogis in the whole world at that time very, very quickly. I would 
just guessed that there were less than a hundred Kriya Yogis in the whole world at the time that Lahiri received his initiation because it was only for highly advanced sadhus who, who were probably living in the Himalayas either with or near Babaji and Kriya Yoga was not known in other lands at that time only in India so it was not it was not in the mainstream of the world but with Lahiri he began to train he drew disciples to him initiated hundreds and hundreds of people into Kriya not only sadhus not only monks but he had many many people he didn't care about householder monk non householder anything he didn't care about what religion people came from he didn't care about caste all he looked at was is the yearning for God deep is the divine spark alive and burning within this heart and is it looking for a way to fulfill itself to find its expression in other words has the spiritual evolution of the God consciousness that resides in everyone has that become awakened enough close enough to the surface that it demands release from delusion demands release from Maya and if so let us give them this technique that will allow that release to happen. Yoganandaji one time in America met a highly advanced monk of a Christian order. And this monk was reputed to be very holy and in fact was. And he had been deeply praying to Jesus for over 25 years. And Master said, let me give you the initiation into Kriya Yoga. And the man said, no, no, I'm not going to take any initiations. I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus. And Master said, you can still follow Jesus. I'm not wanting to change anything. I just want to give you a technique because it's as if you've been in a room and you're trying to get out of that room through the wall, through the floor, through the ceiling. All I want to do is show you the doorway so that you can get out of that room and meet your beloved Jesus. And so understanding that, the man accepted it. And within a week, he had had a direct experience of Jesus manifesting to him. And so this technique is one for those of us who are deeply yearning, deeply wanting God. It's still not a technique for people who have not, let's say their soul's evolution has not brought them to the point where they want freedom from this life. You have to get to a certain point, as Paramahansa Yoganandaji said, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, eventually it becomes an agonizing monotony. Oh, I, maybe you don't know it mentally, but you know it in your soul, in your deep heart. I've tried this path before. I've tried to become successful. I've tried to become wealthy. In fact, I've succeeded in that many times, but it didn't bring me happiness. Do I have to do that again in this lifetime? Do I have to seek here and there and everywhere where I have already sunk those wells and found that there is nothing at the bottom except dry sand? Do I have to dig those wells again in this life? Isn't there something different? Isn't there something more? Isn't there some doorway out of this? We all have that, one could call it the yearning of the soul for 
its own self-realization. We all have that close to the surface or we would not be seeking a path and a technique that allows us release from this world. We would be doing just the opposite. We would be mocking people who thought that they could find happiness by this stupid religious stuff. The vast majority of people in the world think that way. And so the mere fact that we want out shows that we're close to being out. Well, Lahiri, on our behalf, has come in order to introduce into the mind stream of the world the techniques and attitudes that will allow that to happen. And then the other thing that he did, so that's Kriya Yoga, and the importance of Kriya Yoga, or the deep, pathways of meditation and of course he trained his disciples among which was Sri Yukteswar and Sri Yukteswar called to him Yoganandaji who was destined to bring this Kriya Yoga very very widely into the world. Right now there are millions perhaps billions of people on the planet, certainly millions and millions, who at least have heard the word Kriya Yoga. Do you know that recently the government of India decided that the rail line that comes from Ranchi to Howrah Station in Calcutta, that that railroad line should be named the Kriya Yoga Express. So that shows, yes, uh, Jai Guru, that, that shows that this release of the idea and the understanding and the technique into the world is taking a great, great, is having a great, great effect. And we are all the recipients of that. And so all of this, one can't say, oh, Lahiri, you are so great because you did this. One has to say, oh, thank you, Divine Mother, for taking the form of Lahiri and doing this for us because ultimately it is always God. It is only God. That's what the pathway of Kriya Yoga is trying to help us understand. So this deep yearning of the soul is not the yearning of the ego for God. It is the yearning of the soul, which is God, to be reunited without having any more veil in front of us. And so it's really the yearning for the removal of that veil that is going on. But Kriya Yoga, enlightenment, moksha, will not change who we are. We will not die when we achieve enlightenment. We will simply come back into this realization of the self that we have always been and always were, but each time we take on a new incarnation, we take on as if a new role in a drama, and we act that role in the play, and we forget that we have a life outside of the stage that we're on. But this beautiful song that they sang, Cloisters, talking about the eternal yearning of the soul again and again for reunion with our divine beloved is a perfect way to start because that was the pathway out of that melancholy was the whole purpose for Lahiri Mahashaya's incarnation into this world. And so on this day of his Mahasamadhi and in between his Mahasamadhi and his birthday, which is one could say for us the season of Lahiri, it is with great, great gratitude 
and deep reverence that I thank him on behalf of all of us again and again for what he brought and for the grace of this wonderful line of masters and of Divine Mother who empowers them to bring each and every one of us to the realization of who and what we are now, always have been, and will be forever and forever. Namaste, everyone. It is such a joy for us to be here. We were here last year when all this was being assembled, but we have not seen it completed. And it is absolutely thrilling. Our thanks to, I have to say, Daya and Keshava, who unrelentingly, tirelessly, put out energy to manifest all of this. And for all of you who are involved with the center here in Pancho Park and throughout NCR, this is a light for all of Delhi. And Delhi is a light for all of India. So what you've done here is a great thing for God. And you know, the world is changing. And that's good news. We think the future is all the cars and the materialism and the malls. That's not the future. This is the future, truly. All that we hear out there, that will be, re that will be gone. That will be replaced by electric cars and driverless cars and hovermobiles and all that. But what is behind us, the living images of the great avatars, this is eternal. The material world comes and goes, but the presence of the gurus does not come and go. It is constant, eternal. And what great good karma we all have to be here at the feet of the masters, saying, Lord, I hear the call, the siren call, as Master put it, of the world, but I turn my back on the siren call of materialism, and with my heart and my soul, I seek only you. As Jyotish mentioned, just about two weeks ago, we were in Rome, at a, we were invited to speak at a large yoga festival held in a beautiful park in downtown Rome. <clears throat> and it was really a similar experience to this. All around was the city of Rome and the shops and the cars and the, the people of Rome. They're a particular characteristic. They, with all humility to my friends who are Roman, they still have a little pride about the Roman Empire. They still think, well, we're special. We conquered the world. And the Romans are, they have that quality. And, but here we were in this beautiful park, and under trees, just like these trees, there was a little group of people do meditating. Under another tree, there was a group of people doing uh, yoga asanas, just like on the, the International Day of Yoga here in Delhi, when I believe it was 30,000 people came together to 
honor the ancient tradition of India that is changing the world. And there we were in Rome. We had a big pandal. I would say there were maybe 300 people there. And they wanted to hear about yoga. They wanted to hear about the truth that our souls have come to learn. Not where you buy the latest clothes and the latest hairdos and all that. They wanted to find what was real. And it was thrilling. And so the world is changing. And I have to say, Jyotisha and I, we are so humbly grateful to be able to share the teachings of our great masters wherever people are interested. If it's five people, if it's 500 people, it doesn't matter. I remember once uh, when we were establishing the work in Italy, uh, Diana and Jatish and I and a few others were there. <clears throat> Swami returned from America, and he was invited to give a talk in Paris. And so we went there to help him set up and make arrangements. And we came to the hall on the day of the of, uh, his lecture, and we set it all up very nicely. And then we waited for the people to come. No one came. No one came. Finally, we waited 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Finally, one man walked in the door. And Swami wasn't feeling too well. He had a bit of the flu coming from America. And we said, Swamiji, you go back to your room. We'll sit and talk with this man. You don't need to stay. And he drew himself up with deep power. And he said, one person has come to hear me speak about my guru and I will speak to that person and he pulled the two of them <laughs> the two of them sat and talked for an hour and we listened to Swami so humbly so sweetly without any sense of self-importance uh, just talking about his guru talking about how he met him and the, this is what Ananda is doing now it's sharing the teachings of this great line of gurus. And when we come together today to honor Lahiri Mahashaya in particular, it's always a bit, for me, a bit of a challenge because it, our line of gurus are like a great ray of light. You know on a cloudy day when the sun breaks through and there's many shafts of light coming down and yet you look up and they're all coming from the same one source and you can't say which ray of light is more beautiful stronger more important and so it is with our line of gurus they are all shafts of light from the one divine source of God and so it's hard to focus on just one but today of necessity we talk of Lahiri because this this is, as Keshava said, this is the season, the small window between his uh, Mahasamadhi and his birthday. And you know, his Mahasamadhi was September 26, 1825. So that is 120 years ago that he left his body. Not very long, really, in terms of eternity, but the impact that he has had. And what, when we look at all the different shafts of light that represent our gurus, the one shaft, Babaji, he is, one might say beyond creation, not involved in the day-to-day -day business of this world, in with his small handful of followers in the Himalayas. Yes, perhaps as we read in autobiography, from time to time he comes to a Kumbha Mela, he comes to the haunts of men, but mainly withdrawn. But he called his beloved disciple Lahiri 
theory, and uh, as Jyotish was recounting, and said, you must go now. You must be the activating force for the changing times. And I think it's really accurate to say that it was Lahiri Mahashaya that was the harbinger of Dwapara Yuga in everything he did. You know, he died at Mahasamadhi uh, 18, uh, 90, 1895, as we said. I gave the wrong date, 1895. He was born 1828. And, but right before the Dwapara Yuga in earnest began, but he laid the way. I was reading uh, something Swami had written, and I didn't realize, but Lahiri on his little balcony in Varanasi would give his weekly, nightly Gita discourses, and it was he and that was handed down to Sri Akteshwar, and that was handed down to Master Yoganandaji, Gurudeva, and that was handed down to Swamiji, and that was handed down to all of us through Swamiji's uh, essence of the Bhagavad Gita, his presentation of Master's commentaries on the Gita. But it was Lahiri who began, who understood that the Gita had a symbolic hidden meeting, meaning at the end that the characters were, re, were symbolic of aspects of human consciousness. Swami said the Gita could not have been interpreted in such a way other than in Dwapara Yuga. It's not to say in a higher age, I think in a higher age we don't need to read the Gita, we hold it in our hands and the vibrations change our consciousness. But in Dwapara Yuga, we needed to understand that the form that we think of as the Gita, the characters, the story, it's the story of our own movement to moksha, the story of our own effort to find God. And Lahiri it was who gave that first presentation of that interpretation of the Gita. And then it has come down to us now. And it's, I don't know if this is true for you, but for me, reading the Swamiji's in essence of the Bhagavad Gita, if I had no other book to read, if I think if I could read that book over and over, that would be enough because it contains the essence of what the spiritual path is. And then, as we've been saying, Lahiri brought Kriya Yoga out of the, the due to priestly secrecy and man's indifference. It was not available to us. He made it available to us. Again, all these things, because he knew the future uh, that we would be living in right now. It says in Autobiography of a Yogi that Babaji was aware of the complexities of Western materialism. That's everything that's out there. And he knew the impact that it would have on India. And so he sent our guru, Yoganandaji, to the West to reawaken, join the world, Rome, California, Delhi, Pune, everywhere in the power of these liberating teachings. And Lahiri brought them out to us. And then he lived his life so humbly, so simply, raising his children, going about his, going to the office, serving as an accountant. Does an avatar have to do this? Of course not. Why did he do it? For you and me. He did it to show you can live a normal outward life and be absolutely rooted in God. There's no separation. And, you know, there's a beautiful story that we shared 
uh, in the past with you from the life of Lahiri, but it's very important to understand what he was trying to give us. Lahiri had two sons that we read of in autobiography, but he also had three daughters. And one of them was married, living in the house of her husband's family, and she became very, very ill. The doctors were worried that she would leave, leave the body. And Kashimoni, Lahiri's wife, came to him and said, he was her guru as well as her husband. She said, Guru Deva, we must save our daughter. Please do something to intercede. And Lahiri said, very well. And he gave her a little uh, nut. And he said, grind this up, put it in water, and have her drink this, and she will be well. So Lahiri's wife, Kashimoni, eagerly took this and ran to the in-law's house. But the in-laws did not believe in the old traditional ways. She was being treated with a Western doctor. And so Lahiri's wife was reluctant to in interfere with how they were training, treating her with the Western doctor. And she didn't give the ground nut that Lahiri had given her. And in fact, the daughter died. And that night, the Lahiri would have his Gita discourse every evening on the little balcony, which was not much bigger than that little balcony where Devendra and others are sitting and Kuldeep. And the students gathered that night that his daughter had died and said, oh, Master, you don't need to give a discourse tonight. You are too upset. And he said, no, I am fine. Let us continue with our Gita studies. And they said, well, Master, maybe you are fine, but we are too upset to really concentrate on what you were saying. And he said, very well, if you can't focus your mind, we won't have a Gita discourse tonight. And then the disciples asked Lahiri, they said, aren't you upset by what has happened? You seem to be able to, thank you, Shurja, you seem to be able to be continuing as if nothing happened. And Lahiri gave a very, very important answer. He said, I have taken a harder blow than any of you. But the difference between you and me is that I have trained my mind. My mind is like a block of marble that is placed on another block of marble. You can give it a big blow, but it leaves no impression. Your minds, he said to his disciples, are like wet sand. You put a block of marble on it, you give it a blow, it leaves an impression. My mind, it leaves no impression. And this is what he was trying to show us. Sometimes people come to our Ananda centers and they, they have a problem. They want a better job. They want a husband or a wife. And they think that the guru will give them this. This is not the job of the guru. The guru is not to be a wish-fulfilling tree. The guru is to make our minds so strong that whatever happens, it leaves no impression. And Lahiri modeled it for us. And Swami, in, in a talk he gave about Lahiri Mahashaya, and I will close with this, and thank you for your patience. I know it's not so easy with the noise and the so fans to hear clearly. And I know we have a very funny American accent, but so be it. But as Swamiji said, Lahiri showed us the joy of the impersonal life, and that was his greatest gift to us. The joy of the impersonal life, and that's what this avatar, one with God, came to show us. The impersonal, does that mean unfeeling? Not unfeeling, but your mind is ever rooted 
in the eternal presence of God that nothing in this world can ever change, can ever diminish. And so for all of you, our dear friends, it's such a joy to see so many faces that we know that we have shared time together with you and many new friends too. We hope you will become old friends in time as well. But let us honor Lahiri Mahashaya by living as he did in this world but not of the world with our minds rooted in the joy of God. This is his gift to us the joy of an impersonal life lived in God.